Hello, creeps. It's me, John Kassir, the voice of the Crypt Keeper, and you're listening to Chronicles from the Crypt. <laughs> I'm Casualty Chris. And this is Father Malone. And we are the hosts of Chronicles from the Crypt, a twice a month look at the cult horror anthology series Tales from the Crypt that originally aired on HBO from 1989 to 1996. Now, on each of these podcasts, we're going to be doing two episodes from the television series. And along the way, we're going to have some bonus episodes covering some tales ephemera like a kid's cartoon series and a game show and uh, some movies and some other tangentially related tales material. A game show that I would like to point out is essentially a rip off of legends of the hidden temple but sweet let's play when we get there we get there there's no olmec but there is the crypt keeper so you that's know. better that is better agreed on this episode we're gonna be talking about season two episode seven and eight the sacrifice and for crying out loud and we actually have an interview with lee arenberg that we are going to play after we talk about for crying out loud i am newt ladder of cobra and whisker of a rat. Oh, hi, kiddies. I was just rustling up a sickening snack for a ghastly guest. <laughs> Let's see. I need the blood of a sacrificed goat. <laughs> Whoops. It's got to be a virgin goat. Guess you're off the hook, Nelly. <laughs> Tonight's story is about a different kind of sacrifice. A sacrifice made for love. <laughs> All right, so The Sacrifice aired May 15th, 1990. It is directed by Richard Greenberg, written by Ross Thomas, stars Kim Delaney, Kevin Kilner, and Don Hood, along with everyone's favorite nasty villain man, Michael Ironsides. The episode centers around Kevin Kilner as an insurance salesman who murders an obnoxious tycoon to get his seductive wife and fortune, only later to be blackmailed by his rival and boss, Michael Ironsides. So... Mike, what did you think of this turd of an episode? Another motherfucking love triangle. And a bad one at that. Three in a row. What? What is going on? I did not like it. <laughs> I mean, it's not. It's an easy episode to not like. Not only uh, does the is the payoff so insulting in a way that it, it in a way that feels like the people who make this show, and not even the people who make the show, but Ross Thomas and Richard Greenberg think that the audience are fucking morons. Uh, to the fact that it's just again, like you said, it's it's another love triangle in a series of episodes now, three in a row of love triangles. And it doesn't do anything different. No, it, worse than that, it like it feels lifted from Alfred Hitchcock Presents or something. There is no supernatural angle to this, which is fine. You can do that. But then there's no real sort of eerie or creepy aspect to it either. It's just a hard-boiled, like, Dashiell Hammett knockoff. It's... Uh, I, I could not figure out for the life of me why they chose to do this. And let's talk, let's talk about the direction for a second, just because it was directed by Richard Greenberg, who didn't direct a lot. But if you see in a lot of 80s movies, there are visual effects company R slash Greenberg. That's Richard Greenberg's company. So he made his entire career on creating special effects. And there's none in this episode. I, I, I was expecting once I saw his name that we were going to have some crazy flights of fancy or something, but there's just nothing. Um, uh, I, I will say uh, that I did like the performances. I'm, uh, I didn't hate the episode entirely, particularly Don Hood as the, uh, the, the sort of millionaire who is uh, – married to kim delaney like I, I think he did a really good job um michael ironside uh you know i i love michael ironside but he was just kind of okay here well he also doesn't show up until two-thirds of the way into the episode it almost feels like two different episodes 
and that's my biggest issue is there's not it it's an episode that feels longer than the normal runtime because it almost feels like two separate episodes yeah this one does feel like it goes on and on doesn't it yeah with michael ironside showing up and it's like okay so where is this going this character has been mentioned jerry has been mentioned before and then all of a sudden here he is and he's just this kind of creep who's you know it turns out at the end is not doing all the bad stuff that she that uh gloria claims he is which is fine because the stuff that he's claiming is the stuff that she's claiming he's doing is just like so reprehensible in a very tales from the crypt way but it turns out that it's all a sham to get kevin kilner to kill himself and it's just by the end of the episode you're like okay so the payoff was that kevin kilner's character was too nice of a guy except he murders people so why should we feel sorry for him yeah and he's like intimated that he's done this before so it's like why the fuck should i feel bad for him being an idiot and killing himself yeah now uh, not too surprisingly this is actually a shock suspense story uh adaptation shock suspense stories number 10 written by al feldstein with art by jack Kamen. Um, Jack Kamen is uh, the, like the preeminent artist on uh, on the, uh, the the old EC Comics line, and uh, if you read the comic, it's real good. Um, but it uh, it you know they they adapted it pretty straight, like which I you know we've talked about at length that they need to sort of deviate more from. But uh, just uh, for if you haven't seen it, uh, the, the, the episode effectively is um, Kevin Kilner is an insurance agent who comes to this multi millionaire's place to sign him up for life insurance, and he falls in love with the guy's wife, and then she sort of entices him to kill the guy so that they can have the money together, and then he throws the guy off a balcony, which is somehow witnessed by a guy who is obsessed with her, who happens to be Kevin Kilner's boss, who happens to live across from them and had been photographing it. Um, If you don't know you're being set up after that particular web, you kind of deserve to take sleeping pills and kill yourself. Uh, I should point out that the in the comic book, here's where it sort of deviates. And, uh, you know, hey, by the way, spoilers after the fact. Um, In in the in the show, he, uh, you know, he writes out a confession and then he takes a bunch of sleeping pills, and then Kim Delady shows up and burns the confession so that the police won't know anything about it, um, even though it exonerates her. In the comic, it was exactly the opposite, where he did kill himself, but he also uh, writes the letter, and then she takes it like, look, I've got a letter for the police. Now we're all set. I didn't understand why she burned the letter. It actually almost is making sense. It makes zero sense. Zero sense at all. Like, so... The uh, the the Michael Ironside character shows up and he's blackmailing them and the idea is that he's going he wants uh, her to be with him every night and the idea is that he's sort of molesting her in all these like reprehensible ways and you know she shows up one day and she's like oh he hired homeless people to watch us and I'm thinking like okay that's I guess that's pretty bad but maybe if you had been having to be forced to be sex to have sex with the homeless people that would have been a little bit worse but anyway regardless it turns out it's all a sham that they were in on it from the, the get go and uh, they're just uh, uh, they're just turning it on him so he'll kill himself so that they can run off together and, and have the money. And all I could think is, um, why didn't once he once he pushed him over the balcony, she say, yeah, um, no, I don't want to be with you. See ya. And you're a murderer and I'll tell people. I mean, what's this elaborate nine-month ruse? Uh, it's called a plot for this show, and it's really bad, is what it is. Yeah, man. Like it's it's just it's lazy. It's just lazy, and it feels like. And we're only in season two of the show, and it feels like a filler episode. It's like why why are we why are we wasting an episode on this lackluster story? But at yeah. the same time, Don Hood was in Fletch Lives. <laughs> well, all is forgiven. All is forgiven. Don Hood <laughs> was in Fletch Lives. Uh, I'm good. And he was in Alienation. He was in. <laughs> all right, fine. I'll give it to him for Alien Nation. Well, we all know how much you love Fletch Lives. And if you don't know why Mike loves Fletch Lives so much. Uh, You're such a son of a bitch. <laughs> it's a long story, but let's just say Mike loves Fletch Lives a lot. It's my favorite. It is his favorite. I'm looking at the I'm looking at the poster right now in my office. Uh, it is it is his favorite film next to Nothing But Trouble. <laughs> oh, I do love Nothing But Trouble. Yeah, that movie is about as big a Chevy Chase turd as Fletch lives, unfortunately. But I mean, again, back to this admitted. Just I don't I don't understand why this show and the creators of the show allowed anyone to focus on the love triangle episodes or uh, focus on the love triangle stories from the original source material because they're not good. 
Yeah, like, who was at the helm of this ship this season where they were like, yeah, we want to do this story. And they're like, okay. And they're like, another set of writers come in and they're like, we want to do this story. And like, yep, go ahead. And then a third so shows up and is like, yeah, we want to do this one. It's like, you do realize these are all the same story and the first one was the best. So stop immediately. Yeah. But again, it just, they, it feels like they ran out of ideas, but it's like you have so, you have like a breadth of material and you didn't really, you didn't really use it. And it's unfortunate, but at the same time, it's not terribly surprising. Uh, yeah. I mean, I, you know what? Honestly, though, it is kind of surprising exactly. only because they, they came in early. such quick succession. Yeah. Well, it's also surprising it's this early on because I don't remember this many Love Triangle episodes this early in the show's run. Me either. Like, uh, I don't know. Like, maybe I blocked it or something. But, like, it, this this is this is clearly wrong. <laughs> I, I completely agree. So, uh, I mean, can we get a werewolf in here somewhere? Well, you, and then you're going to get a werewolf in a Love Triangle-esque episode, and we're not going to like it very much either. So well, that one's coming God up. God damn Love Triangles. Right. Uh, so I'm going to say skip. Total skip. Uh, yeah. I mean, skip it. I don't think this is as bad as The Thing from the Grave. Um, I p- could probably watch this again. It, Like I said, if it, this was not called Tales from the Crypt, if this had been an Alfred Hitchcock Presents or uh, Tales from the Unexpected or something, I would have been like, yeah, that was okay. Um, but uh, Jesus Christ, I, I, enough already. Skip this one. Yep, I completely agree. We'll play our interview that we did with Lee Arenberg, who's actually in the next episode we're talking about for Crying Out Loud. And when we get back, we'll talk about the episode. Had you watched Tales from the Crypt before you were on the show? I was familiar with the comic books, the old ones, the George Gaines. Um, I mean, it was, it was, uh, I had seen Tales from the Crypt, the movie. It was an anthology movie that came out. Mm, I don't know. I was, it's not late seventies. Cause I remember, I, I remember being scared by it. It was some scary stuff. So I was aware, but I didn't, you know, I don't even know if I had HBO at the time. I forget. I, maybe my parents did at the time. I forget. So yeah, I probably hadn't seen the actual show itself, um, but yeah, oh man, that was a it was an exciting time to land that sucker. And I mean, you were in. I mean, you had you know in that episode, you uh, you interact with Katie Segal, who's gone on to be in you know, Sons of Anarchy. Obviously, you get to be on screen with Iggy Pop, who I mean, you know, don't even really have to extol the yeah. Greatness and Katie, of Iggy and Katie Pop. had just started. I think when we did that show, it might have been the first year of Married with Children too. So she had had yeah, yeah. Yeah, for for no, like, for, my, for my generation, incredible. she's Sons of Anarchy, right? For you know, every, yeah, yeah, yeah. every everybody else that's married with children, and you know. no, I think she's both, really, truly, or, you know. Or even but, the nerds but, is Futurama, so you know, yeah, myself exactly. included. <laughs> so she's, yeah, she's a mega, she's a mega. You know, I think she was a backup singer with Bette Midler. I mean, she's badass. Katie is, she's an awesome person. You know, what a great person to have to play that with, and you know, I was a young, I was a young dude. You know, that was a good, that was a good break for it. I was still in my twenties when I did that part, you know? So, um, it was lucky they hired me. They fought for me. Seaman and Price fought for me, um, against some way bigger names for sure. And yeah, one of the biggest things I remember is it was like, we did rehearsals or whatever. And then Monday, 7 a.m., the first shot of the day, like all the big cheeses are there, or at least a couple of them, like, you know, Dick Donner or Walter Hill, whoever, they were there. I didn't see them. But they were lurking, and literally, like people are nervous because they're on set. And the very first thing at seven was like a rehearsal of me opening the office door and staring at her cleavage, you know. And literally, literally from the first rehearsal, just my my double take on rehearsal of me staring at those that beautiful cleavage cracked the whole set up. And then seven oh five, it's like bye Walter, bye Dick, bye. They were happy, with, you know. And everyone was like, and I was like, well, I just was like, hey, they're just he's just here to fire me if you if I suck, <laughs> you know. Come on, you know. That's always the pressure, you know, that first day or get till you get something in the can. But like I said, I had to carry the whole piece. So, they, you know, there was they had an investment, you know, in in my performance. So. Thank God. I, um, like I said, that's why I told you in the other in the other part of the interview about, you know, our job is just that's what it's all about. It's action is your moment. You're, you know, you, you got to be vulnerable and deliver the goods every time when they, you know, that you, that you can at least more than you don't. Right. So. I mean, you know, what was uh, I mean, this is the second season of the show. So the show was 
picking up steam. I mean, the first or second episode of the second season had Arnold Schwarzenegger directing it. So, I mean, the show is quickly picking up steam. What was the kind of on-set atmosphere like filming, you know, your episode? Wow. I mean, the on-set atmosphere, I mean, for me, it was a lot of focus, to be honest. Different to say than my role in Freaked. I had a lot of stuff to kind of remember, and I had a, a lot of, you know, there were things, there was technical considerations. Once the, once it's revealed that the conscience is talking to me, my ear is always in a shot. So you're, 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 you're focused. I mean, that was my, my main, I mean, of course I had fun. I'm playing a rock guy surrounded by the amazing, when we did the Iggy scenes and, you know, in his band, his band, were, the Spider Middleman was my buddy from the Chucky Weiss goddamn liars band that I used to hang with. Hutt and Tony Sales are in there, really great guys, sons of Sufi Sales. I mean, yeah, the, the, uh, that backup band was righteous, you know, cool dude. So that was a great talk. And it was, you know, great, great, um, obviously my co-stars, but, you know, it was, it was, it's always fun, dude. I mean, that's my, that's how I work. I can't work in a, in a, and I don't like to be uptight. I gotta be loose, you know, especially, especially for something like that where I'm like, I'm I'm going for it. You know, that character was wacky. He was insane. He'd lost his mind. His conscience had driven him insane. And he was, he you know, he confesses to a murder that he could get away with, you know, basically. So, you know, in, in a very dramatic way, putting his head through a speaker and the whole deal, you know. So that was a, that was a very, yeah, well, focused would be my, my main uh, kind of note of like what I remember from 1990, you know, like, yeah. I mean, I was really charged up too. Like I was, I was, that was my thing, you know, it's like, that's what I always wanted. That's what I lived for, you know, as a, as an actor in my creative life was an opportunity like that. So, um, and every opportunity. So that was very, very exciting time for me. So I had to stay focused to be able to deliver, you know, which luckily I did my outfits and, you know, absolutely. It's a, you know, it was very much of the time. Um, and as opposed to some of the other episodes with bigger star names, I was a total unknown, basically. So it gives an audience a chance to kind of like buy into it, you know, because um, they don't know, they don't know me yet, that audience, you know. Um, that was really one of the first shows I ever did where people stop, would stop me. That started my sort of celebrity was that show. Um, first time ever, like on an airplane, I was traveling back east with my mom to go see her mom. And literally, there was a Secret Service detail, an advanced detail that had been with, I guess, Reagan. And then we're flying back uh, to the D.C. area. And they were on the plane and they wanted pictures with me, like on the airplane. That was like the first, that was my first, uh, you know, foray into pictures with fans and I was like that was cool you know yeah did you get to work with Sam Kinison in, at all on set or was he no no I did not actually I had a uh, just say his name was Bill Applebaum Bill was a comedian and Bill did was off camera for me so I but I knew Sam's work and I was familiar with his comedy um, and I did eventually get to know him um, through they used to in the comedy store in Hollywood that was one of the best hot tips back in the day in those same years was Monday night was free. And Monday night was where um, all the comedians would go try out their new material. So on a given Monday night in the big room, you'd have who's hot then Dice Clay, Sam Kinison, Seinfeld, Eddie Murray, uh, Murphy doing all his raw act. Um, they all would get up, all the legends. So I kind of, that's where I connected with him actually was at the comedy store. Um, and he came up to me, which was me. You know, and uh, so I was a big fan eventually of him. But we kind of met pretty soon after the show was done, but never actually. Went. So when you were when you were on set, was there just um, you know filming your scenes where you're supposed to be reacting to your conscience? The other comedian was just saying his lines off set so you could hear them and react to them. Yep, that's right. That's it. And I and I and um, you know again like the, the technical remembering that that the technical requirements of the performance was almost the hardest part of it in that. <laughs> once the camera was sort of like set up and the shot was set, you had to kind of do all of your histrionics within that frame. Right. Because they had to keep that ear. Whenever the conscience was talking, you'll notice the ear is always in the shot. Right. So it started becoming very, you know, that's a that was probably maybe the more challenging as it seems just to kind of be still and yet be crazy and jam q-tips in my ear and go nuts you know q-tips in the you know in, yeah, yeah, yeah. in the ear um i have these balsa wood q-tips right 
um, that would break the ones, and they literally put in an ear like protector. I had a lot of ear. There was a lot of ear makeup going on, obviously. So I had a whole fake ear at one point, and then for those scenes, they literally put a block, put something in there that couldn't be pressed against, so I could jam stuff in there. I was intent, you know. But I had no problem with it, and uh, you know. A lot of it, too, is just miming and controlling the object and getting it right up there. They can't see if your fist is right up against you, know, whatever it was, you know. But, uh, yeah, but it's to this day, I mean, it's still kind of freaky, you know. Like the thought of jamming a hot sharp pencil or that way they did that kind of rack focus to my eyes and my craziness from the sharp tip of the pencil. It was neat. It's a neat filmmaking, you know. The guys that wrote Roger Rabbit, the guys that went on to do like Doc Hollywood and a bunch of other writing and stuff. Really cool dudes that gave me my, basically gave me my shot, you know, plucked me from obscurity, if you will. Did you watch Tales from the Crypt at all after you were part of the show? Yeah. I mean, I did actually. I mean, I think I watched a few of them. Like I said, I don't think I had the HBO at the time, like at my tiny, like after a crash pad or wherever I was back then. But um, yeah, I mean, I remember the Rickles one, the Demi Moore I remember a number of them, you know, uh, but it, again, it's like one of those things where once I was a part of it, it felt it was a good one. Yeah, it felt good. I run into John Cassier all the time. Tales from the Crypt obviously had a big influence on your career then, just from what you've said. Well, I mean, I've never really had like the bounce from any job, you know, that is the dream bounce where it's like, you know, but it, it gets you on the map. You know, and it, it connects you with the fans more than it does. I mean, I think that's sort of like my whatever. The thing about my career is that, I mean, with all the stuff I did as a character guy, it's hard to get that kind of super love from Hollywood. It might take a number of years to get discovered overnight by Hollywood, but the fans kind of pick up on it earlier. And it's all for somebody like me. It's all about the connecting the dots in my career, right? Like to realize that that guy from Tales of the Crypt then did Seinfeld and then went on and did a bunch of Freaked or, you know, these other obscure kind of Dungeons and Dragons and then ends up in Pirates of the Caribbean, right? And now, luckily for the last four seasons, uh, I've been doing, the, you know, Once Upon a Time. So, you know, I definitely feel that the fans for sure start connecting the dots. But a lot of times, even with the the, ra- the rabid young fans of Once Upon a Time, they don't make the connection to Pirate. And I, at first, I was like, oh, that used to like, oh, that was so weird. But then I was like, you know what? I take that as a compliment. That's a real cool compliment, you know? It's about my chops or about blah, 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 however you want to spin it. But it's true, you know? Um, so I'm still working on that. I'm still working on getting the to be an it kind of character guy in this town. And, um, you know, that's it's always good to have something to work for. <laughs> I always wanted to play guitar, but I could never quite master the fingering. <laughs> so I won't be a rock star. I'll just have to settle for being a shock star. Groupies. Tonight's little riff is rife with sex, death, and rock and roll. Now that's entertainment. <laughs> You'll meet a putrefied promoter of pop with an ear for a hit. I don't want to kill it for you. Let's just say we come into the story just when his career is getting real hot. <laughs> All right, so the second episode we're talking about is For Crying Out Loud. It aired May 22nd, 1990. It's directed by Jeffrey Price, written by Jeffrey Price. Stars Lee Arenberg, Katie Seagal, and Iggy Pop playing himself and just kind of doing his Shocker. whole Iggy Pop thing. Yeah, right? He's not playing a, a, a radio DJ at a, at a roller skating rink like he did in the, the acclaimed film Nickelodeon classic Snow Day. Yes, that's a thing. I don't know why it's a thing, but Iggy Pop is in that movie, along with everyone's favorite Fletch, Chevy Chase. The uh, the episode stars Lee Arnberg as a greedy rock promoter who tries to steal the money he raised at a benefit concert when his conscience intervenes. And I guess we should have mentioned who plays his conscience. None other than everyone's favorite screaming comedian, Sam Kinison, the late, great Sam Kinison. So, Mike, what did you think of this 
episode of Tales from the Crypt that's essentially the Telltale Heart. Uh, yeah, isn't it? Um, oh, it, well, it is. Which uh, is pretty, pretty much is just the Telltale Heart. We'll start from the top here. This is, again, not ad- uh, 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 it's not an adaptation of a Tales from the Crypt. This is another shock suspense story, shock suspense story number 15. Uh, this one was actually written by Otto Binder, and uh, it was... Uh, uh, drawn originally by Reed Crandall. Um, I remember watching it and liking it initially when I was, you know, many, many years younger. Um, and I liked it again watching it. Um, you know, I, I constantly have this problem where uh, when you watch episodes back to back, they are they always seem either better or worse in comparison to the previous one. Um, so I think I might have liked this one more than I would have initially – uh, if it weren't uh, on the heels of the sacrifice, but uh, having said that, I I, I I I do like this one. I, Lee Ehrenberg's performance alone is uh, really fantastic, and it has uh, one of the best opening scenes for any Tales from the Crypt, uh, where uh, it's on death row. And his character is being led to the electric chair, but he can't be led because he's so excited to get in the goddamn chair and be fried. Uh, I thought that was uh, that was pretty goddamn funny. Uh, I think the uh, the humor in it is really good. Um, like you mentioned that it was uh, um, uh, what was directed by Peter Seaman, right? Or was it uh, Jeffrey Price? Directed by Jeffrey Price, but it was written by Jeff Price and Peter Seaman, who co-wrote together Who Framed Roger Rabbit, which is uh, kind of a perfect movie. Um, uh, overall, I, I really like this episode, and uh, you know, I don't know. It's it doesn't really for me hold up on repeat viewings, just because um, once you know uh, what's going on, it um, you're kind of like you you can see how obvious that they're sort of concealing things. But uh, overall, I, I enjoyed it. How about you? Yeah, it's one of those episodes, like you said, where I remember really liking it. And Lee Arenberg is the best part of this episode. Katie Seagal is essentially given nothing to do other than to be kind of a bait and switch. And, okay, look, Katie Seagal is a beautiful woman. No one is going to doubt that. But, like, her trying to pass as, like, an accountant, like... (laughs) Oh, oh, no, no, no. the, The episode trying to pull one over on you like that it ruins the episode the more times you watch it. It's kind of it's kind of goofy because you're like, it's his accountant. It's like, oh, my God, fine, whatever. Sure. Tell yeah. Me I mean, do, do you buy her more as a rock chick than as, yes, a, as a as a banker? Yes, I do. And that's because it's Katie Seagal, and I know her as, you know, the char- the character she plays in Futurama, married with children. I mean, everything. Would- she's not a stodgy banker. That's never a character she's ever played, ever in any. That doesn't mean she can't be one. Mrs. Kilbasa. <laughs> okay, yeah. <laughs> of all the things. I know. What, what was going on there? Right. It's Kilbasa is apparently the name, but the way Lee Arenberg says it, it sounds like Kilbasa. Oh. Yeah. But you know, it's it's an interesting idea for an episode, but it pretty much is just the telltale heart. Like, to yeah, fault, it is to a fault almost. Yeah, and you know, in the in the original comic, it is uh, like it, this story. Uh, the the episode we watched, it's you know, he's a rock promoter and he's putting on a rainforest benefit, and he's raised a million dollars and he's going to run away with that money, and uh, it's all pretty self contained, like a bottle episode. It all takes place at the club, essentially. Um, Except for the the, the wraparound. Uh, in the original comic, there was none of that. The guy had just uh, – uh, he had just either come into the money or somehow swindled the money, and this girl shows up and wants it. And uh, in the uh, sort of ensuing fight where he kills her, uh, she scratched his face – and then his conscience kicked in and started talking to him. And uh, as he was going around through the city, people kept giving him crazy looks. And uh, he thought it was because they could hear the conscience talking, but it wasn't. It was the fact that they were looking at the, all the, the the fact that his face was gouged open. So it's the, essentially the basic premise. Um, I will say that uh, I'm glad they went with what they went with. Um, this is one of those episodes where uh, they actually took the material and went, let's do something else, which is always welcome. And um, But let's uh, let's talk Sam Kinison for a sec. Yeah, because Sam Kinison is, uh, outside of Lee Arnberg, is the second best part of this episode. And look, there are people that don't like Sam Kinison's act. And you know what? I completely get it because Sam Kinison's act, in my mind, is best in small doses because it does become a little bit much. In my mind, Sam Kinison is Bill Hicks without... Bill Hicks with 50% less of kind of the introspection that Bill Hicks had. Yeah. That's kind of always the way I saw Sam Kinison. And there is a place, a time and place for a comedian who 
is an angry comedian because Sam Kinison is the stereotypical angry comedian. And I do like Sam Kinison's act. I think he's great in this, but yeah, he small doses is the way to absorb Sam Kinison unless he is your thing and you love him and he is your favorite, then I get it. But for me, small doses. I'm right there with you. Um, I think his act could uh, have moments of uh, little pockets of brilliance. Um, but overall, like I, you know, it, yeah, the, the less, the better. Um, it's, I think it's a really impactful act when you're getting a 15 minute set, but like if you have to listen to him for an hour, it's just wearying. And, uh, the, the sort of, uh, the cracks begin to show. Um, but I liked him here. Uh, I couldn't imagine a more perfect role than a nagging conscience for him to play. Uh, I think it, I think it was a really good part of the episode. And, you know, look, I grew up in the mid-90s. I was born in 1990, so I didn't see Sam Kinison's act until, like, much later. But did he, in your mind, have a big influence on comedy as a whole? Because I kind of don't understand if he did. I think it was one of those things where there hadn't been anyone like him. And I don't I, I don't mean there hadn't been anyone like him in a long time. It, it felt... Like, uh, he, this type of comedian had never been on the scene, the sort of, like, ragingly angry comedian. I mean, there had been plenty of angry comedians uh, throughout history, but uh, no one as uh, straightforward furious. Right. And, um, I don't know, I remember being, like, off-put by it uh, at the time. Um, Sometimes less is more, and in comedy... My favorite comedian of all time, period, is George Carlin. And George yeah, well, Carlin, you can't get more cerebral than Carlin. Right, and in my mind, it's because Carlin brought out the most cerebral nature of comedy while also being completely and utterly foul mouth, but not being foul for foul's sake. Like, there are comedians who just, you know, say, fuck, 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 shit, fuck, fuck, you know, cunt, piss, motherfucker, shit, tits. And that's fine. But Carlin did it with a purpose. He wasn't Andrew Dice Clay, who is absolutely the worst, com- one of the worst comedians ever. Yeah, and you know, at the time, um, that was sort of the the two reigning uh, voices in comedy seemed to be Andrew Dice Clay and Sam Kinison. Hey, and uh, Dice to his friends, Dice. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. At the time, I was, uh, you know, I was into like Stephen Wright. And uh, even Emo Phillips I was into, uh, uh, which puts me on the complete opposite end of that particular spectrum. Uh, although, you know, sort of crazy and raging can, uh, can work too because uh, I was also a big fan of a, of a fellow in a future episode uh, named Bob Goldthwaite. Um, but they all seemed uh, a little more on the ball. They all seemed like they had something to say. Uh, Sam Kinison always came off to me as a uh, sort of rage for rage's sake, you know? Like, well, he um, had a voice for it. That's the one thing you got to give him credit he, for. He look, man, he, sh- he sure did. And you know what? Maybe it was a breath of fresh air because there hadn't been anything like that. It's just it didn't go anywhere. And uh, to actually answer your question, no, I, I don't think he had as big an influence uh, as uh, people thought it was going to be just because um, it was such a singular persona. Um, like, he wasn't backing it up with, you know, uh, any particular deep thoughts or anything. Uh, he wasn't coming at comedy from any new interesting angle. It was just screaming. I mean, I guess Lewis Black technically, you know, is apoplectic these days, but um, uh, I don't I don't think there was any influence there. I could be wrong. Who knows? Well, and the thing is, I mean, you can have a singular persona. I mean, you have someone like Robin Williams, who is a singular persona. There's really hasn't been anyone else like him. And and in my mind, you can be a singular persona, but I just, I, 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 I just don't see what, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> I, I, I like Sam Kinison in this episode, but, you know. Yeah, I mean, look, he's perfect in this, in this role. There's no question about it. But let's talk Lee Ehrenberg, who is uh, n- perfect in this role. He's great. Uh... Uh, an actor I've always sort of enjoyed every time he comes on screen. You know, we've talked in the past. He's the Human Torch in Freaked. Um, he's in the Pirates of the Caribbean movies. He's real good in those. Um, one of uh, one of my earliest sort of uh, uh, times I saw him, he's in a movie called Roadside Profits, uh, directed by Abby Wool. He's in it for about two seconds, but for two seconds he's really memorable. Um, good, solid actor, and um, 
I don't know that this episode would have been as successful if he hadn't been in it. Like, occasionally you get an actor who gets the tone uh, as well as uh, anyone possibly could have. And I, I, I think that he does, man. Um, and, you know, not to mention um, his acting style, but, like, you know, he is sort of saddled with having to act to one side very technically – um, so we don't reveal the, the sort of twist. So it's, you know, it's an interesting balancing act to watch where he's not only, uh, like having to be super technical, but he also has to come up to this level, um, that the, uh, that the episode is trying to achieve. And I think, uh, it, it, if it does work at all, it's because of him. I'm sure most people just remember Sam Kinison screaming the entire time, but uh, Lee Ehrenberg like makes me laugh every time I watch it. In fact, uh, occasionally when somebody says like I can't hear you, like I hear it as Lee Ehrenberg, I can't hear you. Like I, I, I don't know. I've, that's my whole life. So I'm gonna say this is a successful episode just based on the fact that it's stuck in my head all these years. But you're right. I mean, Lee Ehrenberg is God. He's just. It's unfortunate that he's known for one thing now that doesn't really give him a whole lot to do. Hello, Buffett. Like okay. Right. Like, shit, man. Like, god damn it. Like, that's if you say that, people will be like, oh yeah, that guy. But it's like, <laughs> man, the, you know, the human torch from or is it the human torch the eternal flame? What is it? The eternal flame. The eternal the eternal flame and freaked is what I will always remember him as. And that's how I initially spoke with him, and then I had to ask him about Tales, but it was initially for Freaked, because that movie is probably my favorite movie ever. But what am I gonna do? Say my favorite movie is freaked, and people just go, Oh fuck are you talking about? <laughs> uh, but that's what Lee Arnberg to me is the eternal flame from Freaked, and he's just a great actor, and I always think about him in this episode because he is the glue that keeps this episode together when it could have fallen apart or felt just flat like a, you know, telltale heart ripoff. Mm-hmm. And he makes it not feel that way. So for me, this episode, total watch. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Go watch this one. It's uh, it's fun, ultimately. Um very few of the comedic episodes sort of hit the comedic tone. Uh, this one kind of does it right from the get go. Um, uh, you know. Uh, uh, by the way, enough enough with Iggy Pop. Stop stop doing that. Oh, I- I- Iggy Pop looks like a total clown in this episode with his like short bowl cut hair. Man, not the Iggy Pop that I want to think about when I think of Iggy Pop. Yeah, man. I mean, you know, cash that check, Iggy. Yeah, Iggy's doing the Iggy thing, but the Iggy thing ain't working in 1990 right now. Yeah, it no. looks just kind of like old man on stage, Iggy Pop, and now he's still doing it 28 years later. Yeah, it's like uh, trotting Shana Na out or something. Yeah. So. But uh, on the next episode, we're going to be talking about season two, episode nine and ten, four sided triangle. I bet you can guess what that episode's about. Hmm. And the Quest dummy featuring the aforementioned Bobcat Goldthwait. Until then, however, where can people find you, Father Malone? Well, other than here, you can find me on YouTube at my channel, Ot5 Films. I've got a show called You've Never Seen, uh, chronicling some of uh, these uh, movies that uh, you maybe have not seen, and you probably ought to. And you can also catch me on another podcast called Dreams for Sale, the Twilight Zone 85 podcast, where uh, me and a couple of kooks talk about uh, the revival of the Twilight Zone that happened in the mid-80s. And uh, you should check that out, because it's a great podcast about a great series. And you can follow me on Twitter at Culture Stash. And if you want to hear me talk about movies, not TV shows, you can head on over to CultureCast.com, where that's my movie podcast, where me and my buddy Eric talk about movies. We have some guests on from time to time. Aforementioned Father Malone is on there. Uh, yeah. We talk about movies, and I'm also on a Kolchak the Night Stalker podcast called The Kolchak Tapes with my buddy Mike White, where we talk about one episode of Kolchak the Night Stalker once a month. So you should check those out. Until then, big thanks as always to John Kassir for that kick-ass intro, and we will catch you on the next episode. Mm-hmm.